Hi, this is Evelyn Lopez. Welcome to Sustainability in Your Ear, the Earth911.com podcast for the week of March 9th. It is early March. We are seeing the first signs of spring. So, and the first signs of the coronavirus. And the first signs, actually, in Washington State, where I am located, staying with Mitch and our producer, Doug, we're seeing a lot of signs of coronavirus, <laughs> or at least in the news. It's in so, Boston. Yeah. It's just with spring becomes uh, the coronavirus season. So, but this time we're going to talk about sustainability around the home. You might be doing some spring cleaning. It's a good time to look around you, look at your practices and see whether you want to make some changes. So let's talk about that. But we have uh, Mitch Ratcliffe, our Earth 91 publisher. Mitch, how are you today? Doing darn fine. I'm, uh, I'm uh, working at home uh, because I can't visit the office where I earn part of my living. Very good. Very good. And uh, we may have our uh, one of our Earth Nine One writers, Sarah Lozanova, make join in. We we weren't sure this morning, so we just wanted to get ahead and get going. So let's start by talking about laundry detergent. What do you use? Powder, liquids, pods? I use uh, liquids that are, you know, I use those unscented, um, no itch liquids. I've never used the pods, but uh, Mitch, tell us a little bit about laundry detergent. Yeah, this is a, this is an interesting story. And actually, uh, through some interaction with a reader, we have yet another option we'll talk about. Mm. But so uh, laundry detergent, obviously, is one of the great conveniences of our modern world. Uh, and they can be uh, good for the environment and bad for the environment, the actual chemicals that are used to wash our clothes. Uh, and in addition to the to the detergent itself, the packaging is something we all have to think about it when we buy. And so the three different options that we looked at in the um, uh, article, powder detergent, liquid detergent, uh, and detergent pods, is, uh, uh, each have different packaging issues. Uh, but all of them, if you go out and look for the safer choice label from the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, mm-hmm. they call out what are environmentally responsible chemicals in detergents. And so look for that label first and foremost to find something that isn't going to, that the detergent itself won't be bad for the environment. And then you have to start thinking about the packaging. And that's where we focused in this article. So yeah. powdered detergent obviously comes in cardboard, uh, uh, press board, and that is very recyclable. You simply have to make sure that you dump out all the material before you send it through the recycling. Liquid detergent in a bottle is probably the most challenging and Mm -hmm. and difficult for the environment because um, there's always a lot of of, uh, residue inside and getting that out so that it doesn't contaminate the recycling of all the other materials that go in with that jug uh, is something that the consumer needs to take responsibility to do. So you need to rinse these things out thoroughly before putting them through recycling. So I do use a liquid detergent and luckily I have still curbside plastic recycling, but yeah, you do have to clean it out thoroughly and cleaning out detergent bottles is not necessarily an easy thing. It's kind of like shampoo uh, and other things. It's so foamy that you really do have to, you know, kind of fill it up and let it sit and rinse it out and rinse it out again. So yeah, I can imagine that a lot of people may be somewhat frustrated by that. And then your better option is to not use that then. And the answer has been for a lot of folks detergent pods and uh, mm-hmm. or, or detergent packs. Actually, detergent pods is a, uh, a registered trademark. Uh, Tide pods, uh, and of course, there are some people out there who think you can eat them. Uh, but yes. we, w- with all seriousness, folks, don't eat your t- your detergent pods. <laughs> it's uh, never a good idea to eat your detergent. But these uh, these pods are made of a gel pouch that breaks down in the water and then just all of it flows away. So there is a, a lot of upside to using the pods. The question is, mm-hmm. what do they come in? Do they come in a big box? Do they come in a plastic bag? Do they come in something else? And uh, that's where you need to think about the packaging of the product. Even though the product itself breaks down and disappears, the packaging makes a difference. So look for detergent pods in something that is recyclable, cardboard being your best choice. But we also got a note from a, a reader who pointed out detergent sheets. And I had actually never heard of this, nor did her writer uh, uh, when we were working on the story, uh, Taylor Ratcliffe. And he, uh, uh, so we exchanged a little mail and found out about detergent sheets, which are- Yeah, I don't uh, know what those are either. So what are those? They are essentially a woven sheet of detergent, uh, and they come in a slip uh, uh, case. So that slip case can be paper or plastic. You pull out one of these sheets, drop it in, and it acts as your detergent. It disappears. Hmm. 
The packaging, because you're talking about sheets of detergent, are very efficient. So, so you can get a, a, a nice plastic, um, or excuse me, a nice paper uh, package that just can be recycled very easily with minimum material involved because it's just a slip case. And the one that we found that was most interesting was uh, True Earth detergent sheets, which come in uh, a, um, a paper slip cover. So uh, there are a bunch of different ones, uh, True Earth, Well Earth Goodness, uh, or well Earth Goods, excuse me, make this. Seventh Generation makes a, uh, a mm-hmm. detergent sheet as well. And uh, check these out because this is something that we had not uh, discovered. And we're going to build into this article as we release another version of it. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if those would work as well. I have a front loading washer. And so I'm a little bit hesitant to use. I don't I don't quite know how to use something that, you know, that doesn't go through the top of the washer into the into the wash. But that um, it's very interesting. Well, let's, you just drop this in and it, it breaks down. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I was also very interested in the um, piece about DIY detergent. I have a friend who makes her own mm-hmm. laundry detergent. She swears by it and says, you know, you can, she makes up a bucket of it in like a kitty litter bucket and says it, you know, it lasts for months and months and months. Uh, and I think you can, you can uh, make a detergent that is a very um, effective and yet very environmentally friendly. And I, I happen to notice, you know, um, when I pull up our website, Amazon also suggests products beneath the stories, and they have a laundry soap kit that looks like it's made of a um, Arm and Hammer washing soda, uh, mm-hmm. borax, and a Fells Napa soap. So those are pretty simple ingredients, all coming in paper packaging. Yeah, you can also use steel soap. We have a there's a Earth nine one one TV episode about how to make a simple DIY laundry okay. detergent. So search on DIY laundry detergent on Earth nine one one and find that. Excellent. A lot of things to try. And you know, it's a, try it. You never know. I mean, try something different. You might find something that works even better. And, and I appreciate and it's all it. part of getting down, you know, lowering our footprint. These small right. actions do add up because they end up being rippling back through the economy because people start making these changes and companies will follow yeah. us because they want to sell us things. They want to sell us things. Yes. So, Along that line, here's another small change that could be interesting. Um, We have a great story on how to build an eco-friendly shaving kit for men and for women that features um, options that are um, more environmentally friendly than your regular plastic disposable razor. Yeah, this is is an interesting thing for me. I'm I'm just one of those lazy shavers that just grabs the razor and uses some water and shaves. Mm -hmm. I guess that's painful, but it doesn't hurt me. Uh, But uh, you can really take some time and take care of your skin by creating a a shaving kit that is using uh, sustainable and and biodegradable materials like coconut oil and and, uh, uh, steel soap and baking soda to create a a, a nice uh, uh, lather that you can put on. And uh, and the other thing you can do is get rid of those plastic replaceable razors. Uh, So look for a a steel razor uh, that has replaceable blades and only the blades then become waste. One of the things you have to keep in mind if you're going to use this is you can't take those blades on an airplane, but uh, oh, good point. It is, Interesting. It is a good solution if you want to take the chemicals and the unsustainable elements of your your daily shave or weekly shave, depending on how frequently one does it. Yeah. Uh, and 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 replace it. So this is a the guide has a bunch of nice uh, uh, suggestions, including a vegan toiletry bag that you can carry mm-hmm. stuff in, uh, different razors that you can use, and I think that's really the hard part for a lot of folks is thinking about using one of these non vibrating. Only one blade, not 74 blades, because that 74th right. blade really makes the difference. <laughs> That's and right. We've been, we've been uh, taught that more blades is better, but in fact, one blade well taken care of is just as effective. I think that's true. I'll tell you, when I was growing up, my mom had her razor always in the shower, and it was an old fashioned, you know, metal razor with the safety razor blade in it. And and I can remember trying to use that to shave my legs and really cutting the hell out of my legs. So I'm a little bit afraid of those razor blades, but I think they do a really good job. But even if you're not quite willing to go to the full old time razor blade, 
if you got something where just the head pops off, you know, you have a, mm-hmm. uh, you have a razor where you just replace the cartridge heads. That's a lot better than replacing the whole plastic razor every time. Absolutely. And, um, the idea here is to, to minimize what you throw away. Now, one of the mm-hmm. things we also, and we linked to this out of the, the article as well as another Earth 911 TV episode where we uh, show how to make a sustainable shaving cream. And it yes. requires a cup and a half of water, one cup of Dr. Bronner's Pure Castile soap, mm-hmm. and three quarters of a cup of baking soda. You mix it together and then you whip it into uh, the froth that you put into your, your shaving kit and uh, it's it's going to be great for your skin and not bad mm-hmm. for the environment the other thing that i didn't really think about and again i'm just one of these you know wet the razor and shave guys is using something like coconut oil or jojoba oil to um, lubricate your skin and treat your skin yeah. shave and that really mm-hmm. sounds great i i i should take more time shaving Mm-hmm. I think that's right. Well, and it kind of depends. If you have like a really heavy beard, then I think you have to think more strategically about this because it, you know, in order to cut through your uh, shaving stubble, you're kind of, you, you know, you're kind of really dragging it on your skin. If you if you've got more of a, you know, not so heavy beard, I think you may be able to get away with doing less. Well, I, but I, I thought have this had straggly hard beard. Yeah. I particularly liked the reference back to the um, shaving brushes and, um, you know, shaving cups and things like that, because I I think that's not only is it environmentally friendly because you're not buying cans of material, but it's kind of pleasant. I mean, I I do kind of like the idea of, you know, if if you can, yeah, take a little bit of time, spoil yourself a little bit and, um, you know, make it, make it a moment to kind of get yourself centered and started on your day. And by the way, the shaving cup that is called a scuttle, which I had never really thought about before. So. I never knew that. I never knew I that. Also, yeah, we've got. I also the, like the fact that the best uh, suggestion is a washcloth. And I think we yeah. all take care of those and wash them using a detergent sheet, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. See how we can I tie all this together into one sustainable story? One sustainable thing to do. But yeah, I think all of these are really good suggestions and it's a perfect time to, you know, try something new. Try something new in the spring, especially if you're at home for extended periods of time as you are avoiding coronavirus. There you go. I think you go. We'll be, we're going to be doing a story in the next couple of weeks about different ways we can think about changing our habits if coronavirus drastically interrupts our daily life. It is an opportunity to reset. Yeah, it is. That's, that's a good thing to think about. And so another thing to think about is pesticides in the food we buy. Yeah, yeah. You know, the one of the reasons that I try to buy organic foods as frequently as I can is, first of all, I think that's good because they're not treated with pesticides. They're not coming into my home. But also, I want to promote and help support those farming practices where they're trying to use alternatives to pesticides um, on the land. Mm-hmm. But um, you can't find organic everything and some of your favorite products may not be organic. And so this is very interesting. There was a study pesticides in the pantry that looked at the common foods in our, in our households and how they scored on a pretty comprehensive list of factors. Yeah. So the uh, organization that did this is called as you sow. Uh, and that's at as you sow.org. And the, the uh, research was called pesticides in the pantry transparency and risk in food supply chains, which is a lot more interesting than it may sound to many of you. (laughs) Uh, And what they did is looked across uh, 14 major U.S. food manufacturers and 30 different performance factors within their supply chains, where they uh, source their uh, food, where they process their food, and how their food is preserved. And uh, it's interesting because the results were that um, only two of the companies out of the 14 even got close to halfway to a good, to the best score. The highest score overall was only 18 out of 30. And the average across the 14 companies was a 6.1. So there's obviously a ton of improvement in terms of pesticide uh, prevention in our foods that we can undertake. Uh, The two companies that earn no points at all, Post and B&G Foods. B&G makes uh, green giant vegetables and Ortega Mexican foods, as well as grandma's molasses cookies. So those uh, are probably foods you want to begin to consider uh, carefully before you pick them up in the future. 
Well, one of the very interesting things about this study is um, some of these businesses, even the ones that scored well, General Mills scored well, PepsiCo scored well, comparatively. They're, they're not actually yeah. high scores, but yeah. they're compar- better than some of the others. A lot of these companies are some of the ones that were fighting very, very uh, hard uh, in the political arena a few years ago against um, GMO labeling. A lot of them have uh, corn-based uh, products, and corn is uh, is one of the plants that you often uh, have genetic modifications on. Yep. And um, it's kind of an interesting. I mean, so one of the things that I think has happened, I'll divert here a little bit philosophically, because we now have so many options for um, getting organic groceries. You know, we've got high end grocery stores, we've got organic pro- products in pretty much all your regular grocery stores too. I think we kind of have almost this market divergence where a lot of people who are, you know, educate themselves on food and care deeply about what goes into their food and comes in their home are sort of gravitating towards those markets and those products. And that allows, you know, sort of the mainstream products. I don't think that they've been pushed to change as much as they would have been if we didn't have these alternatives. I mean, it just seems like they're able to kind of inhabit that space and say, yeah, you know, we're just making the same Cheerios that we've always been making and you love them. And it's sort of like, well, it's interesting. I mean, it's I, I don't I know what a good it's... close look at those Cheerios though. And that's, that's the yeah. difference. And I think yeah, what's but, challenging here but is But I don't that... think that people, I don't think people are saying you really should change Cheerios. I think what they're saying is, oh, you know what? Here's an organic Cheerios on the whole foods aisle. A, a, a like product uh, that yeah. appears to be the same, but is has a, a sustainable label. And that's the question is, how do you get that kind of information? And, and looking into the supply chain the way that As You So did is an important way to begin to do that. But we don't have this on the on the shelf. Uh, you know, there's no simple way right now to check the mm-hmm. sustainability of food. And of the, of the companies, the 14 companies, only three of these companies have actually uh, included reducing pesticides as part of their sustainability uh, in, in sourcing programs. So, and that includes Del Monte, General Mills, and PepsiCo. Uh, mm-hmm. We're we're talking about an environment in which consumers don't have the information to provide the feedback that they want to, and they end up making these like decisions, which may not be better for them, or may not provide better nutrition as compared to sustainability. We don't right. know. And, and so the trade-offs are what we need to start to articulate. And, and to your point about the way this has become a, a, a general social practice or is on the way to becoming is that we, a lot of what we understand about the way the world works today is based on science that has illuminated areas that we simply didn't pay attention to before. And now mm-hmm. that information is available. Does that make our lives more complex and complicated? Yes, it does, but it can be simplified with good labeling. And, and you know, we talked about the detergent labeling um, program earlier. We need something in our food labeling that uh, allows us to understand the sourcing and the sustainability of all the product, not just the finished product, but, you know, where each part of it came from, the corn, mm-hmm. the oats, the water they used. You know, was that pulled out of an aquifer and no longer available for local uh, farm use. Mm-hmm. Those are the kinds of things we need to be starting to think about. And it requires simple labeling that shows the impacts and the trade-offs in such a way that we can make those good decisions. And when we have that, customers will reshape the economy because they'll be able to vote with their dollars. Yeah, I think so too. And it, it also sort of made me think, you know, one of the products that we buy pretty regularly um, is uh, Jif peanut butter, than Jif natural peanut butter. And it doesn't have a lot of the additives in it, um, but it's not, I don't, it's not organic. And, uh, and it's made by J.M. Smucker, which is, um, you know, not a high scoring. I mean, that's one of the lowest. Yeah. They got, they got a two out of 30. Yeah. So um, it just, I, what, what I would like to do is to, maybe I will get in touch with Smuckers and say, look, I really like your product. We like this peanut butter. But I would really like to see you improve your practices so that I can continue to buy it. And I don't know a company that uh, if they get an earnest, considered letter from a customer saying, I'm really reconsidering buying your product in the future, would not Mm -hmm. pay attention to that. Now, you know, there may be be kind of a, 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 
a gut reaction that says, oh, that's just an outlier who doesn't really right. matter. But in fact, when 10 people do it, that changes everything. And when 100 people do it, then the president or the vice president in charge of the division hears about it. And when 1,000 people do it, the CEO pivots the company. Well, and certainly, at least it might cause them to say, well, let's look at, you know, what would our what would it take to change our practices in this area? Um, what what would it cost? You know, it's in this in that business world, you know, where they're always sort of looking at their cost margins. I think it's just that, you know, is there enough customer demand or customer interest to make it worthwhile for us to look at what it would take to do something a little bit different? Because as long as no one's asking them to, then why would you bother? So here's a, here's a here's a metaphor. Uh, mm-hmm. The the Chinese environment, the the actual air is much cleaner than it was prior to the um, coronavirus outbreak, where they locked down 750 million people. Oh, yeah, because people aren't driving, uh, and they're not building things, and and, and so the and air pollution is. Huh. But you know this 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 you know think about what we are going through in the states, and the fact that you know we're not going to be able to shop the way that we were able to shop normally for some period of time, Mm -hmm. Uh, we are going to be at least concerned about being out there. Maybe using the data that is available online to order things or to to begin to reconstruct the way we get our food can all be catalyzed by this break point of the virus. And, you know, we have a, a, a highly technological society, but one that has tried to ignore all the external costs of everything that we do and mm-hmm. I think you know, our, our current administration in the United States is the exemplar of ignoring the externalities and only counting the money. At yeah. the end of the day, you have to count all of the impacts, including the health impacts, the environmental impacts, the changes in weather, too. And all of that is something that we're at a point where we know voters are saying that climate change is critically important to them. We know that uh, consumers are asking for this, but we haven't ever been able to catalyze the full feedback loop and now perhaps Mm -hmm. that's a good idea well and you're right i mean we've never really we've never had the access or the um connectivity that we have now i mean it's not hard to send a message to a large company a corporation now um to say you know i have some concerns about your product um yeah maybe maybe it can be a good thing uh, so much has changed over the last 25 to 30 years because of the rise of telecommunications infrastructures that it is time to start to use it for these these purposes rather than simply the things that we were accustomed to, which is sell without questions. Now it's time to start answering those questions. So we have another story from our last story we wanted to mention today. And now, we, now we just, yeah, now we just have a coronavirus theme going. So this is a, Something you can do while you're at home, avoiding the coronavirus. There you go. I like that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. (laughs) You can take up a craft like reusing aluminum cans. So we have this great story on the website uh, about um, eight ways to reuse aluminum cans. And some of them are actually quite beautiful and very involved. Um, you know, I, you know. so there's a pop-top lampshade. So they took all the pop-tops off and, and knitted a lampshade, which is really kind of beautiful. It is beautiful. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of other ones here. Uh, you know, you can create a, an, an RFID proof soda can wallet using two pieces of can and some packing tape. Uh, and and this is, you know, these are interesting little ideas, including making a small stove, uh, beautiful holiday ornaments, cutting out I leaves. I love and, those holiday ornaments are beautiful. They're uh, leaves and they're, they look like, I think, they probably uh, um, have a soda can design on one side and then the, yep. the silvery aluminum on the other side. Those are beautiful. Those would look really, really fantastic in a wreath or on your Christmas tree or in any decoration. There was one uh, earrings that were made from part of a Coke can mm-hmm. and, and some uh, dangles that hang off it. But the red and white of the Coke can really stands out and, and makes really you look at the ear. And then you see these, these uh, golden dangles that look like leaves. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and this is kind of interesting. I was just at a, a, a massive can manufacturing plant uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we had about a million cans while I was there, and I was only there for 45 minutes. Wow. But, you know, they're now making cans in so many different shapes. And, 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 and you know, some look like bottles. Some have resealed mm-hmm. caps and so forth. But these are all 
potentially interesting craft pieces as well. You know, if you could get something that is already pre-shaped in an interesting way and then use that shape as an artist, as a craftsman to do something interesting, yeah. that is a, that's a great uh, new set of tools or at least resources to use to make cool stuff. And, and, yeah. and, and you know, aluminum is incredibly recyclable, uh, much more so than, than paper or, or plastic. But if you can use a little of it around the house to make your home more beautiful and at the same time keep that that aluminum in use, go for it. And this yeah, is a great set idea. Well, the, the number seven, the little uh, lantern mm-hmm. tea light holders that you could hang outside for your summer decorations, those are gorgeous. I mean, I, I would I I would make these and I would also buy them. So, I mean, if you're a crafty person and you wanted to get a stall at a summer craft fair, I bet you could sell these for at least $5 a piece, if not a little bit more, depending on your area. Yeah, and and again, uh, keeping that in circulation and and useful is the best possible use of anything that we've already produced because it uh, doesn't need to be replaced. No, this is a really fun article. So when you're sitting at home trying to figure out what to do, take a look. There's some interesting DIY projects and fun craft projects on the website. Well, those were the stories we wanted to highlight today. Anything else going on, Mitch, that you wanted to mention? Yeah, I wanted to uh, just mention that everybody should be aware that Earth Day 2020 is coming up. It's going to be on April right. 26th. This year is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and the, the organization Earth Day uh, at earthday.org is working to get a billion people out to do something on that day, whether it is to march or to clean up parks or to uh, clean up beaches. There, there are uh, events all over the country. And if you go to Earth uh, Earth 911, we are going to be carrying a whole series of articles about what Earth Day is getting ready to do at those events. And you can check out earthday.org slash earthday2020 uh, with dashes between Earth Day and 2020 to find events in your local area. So you can actually go and search and see on a map what's going on around you and pick the thing that'll be the most fun for you or your family to do together. So I urge everybody to think about this Earth Day as a moment to take time for speaking for the planet. And I hope you all uh, check out what we cover and what Earth Day is doing. Very good. I agree. Well, we had some good questions, Earthling questions come in. Uh, Kathy on Facebook asks, you know, this is this one fills you with horror probably. But so Kathy yeah. says, so... How can I find out what it would cost to mail VHS tapes to you? And is there a weight limit? And how often? It'll probably come down to what I can afford every few months. Thanks. So Kathy's heart is in exactly the right place. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, we don't accept materials. <laughs> Please don't send me VHS tapes because we, you know, the, 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 the headquarters office is already crowded enough. <laughs> right. And, uh, but we do uh, uh, on the uh, the Earth nine one one search database search dot earth nine one one dot com have links to various mail in programs that will take VHS tapes around the United States. There are currently two of them that are active, uh, and uh, the uh, the thing about VHS tapes is you have to understand that there are multiple materials involved. So the 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 case itself, you know, the, the that the tape is in is plastic number five. Not a widely recycled material, but it is material that if it is captured clean and separate can be processed. And so companies like uh, uh, Green Disc uh, have a mail-in program where you buy a box and then fill the box up and send it in. And that would be a good way for Cindy to look at the potential cost of taking care of her VHS tape overload, uh, wherever those are coming from, uh, to take care of this on an ongoing basis. But uh, mail-in programs are probably your best bet. Uh, The other um, thing to think about is uh, reusing those tapes. Uh, You could use them, obviously, for recording, but there are other things you can do uh, in the craft space, like we were talking about before, with the tape or other things. But you really probably best served by having this stuff recycled. Yeah, I agree. And and to echo Mitch, don't don't send it to Earth 911. That's not a good option. Well, we will do something responsible with it, but it 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 will detract from our ability to work on this site. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So related to sort of what we do on the website, Isabel asks by email. She says, "I sell backpacks, bags, handbags, and accessories 
made with organic and recycled materials. My business is new, started in September last year. Please add my website to your website to help me grow and reach wider audiences and contact me with feedback, inquiries, and questions. Well, and again, uh, Isabel's asking a great question, and it's one that we hear probably 10 to 15 times a day. Uh, we get email from all over the world from people who are creating businesses and using uh, sustainable strategies to, to make or to um, grow things. And we want people to find out about that, but we simply don't have the, the writers to cover all this stuff. So what we've done instead is created a forum in the Earth, in the Earthling forum. So you can go to earth911 slash community and you can find a whole list of things. Look for sharing my sustainable business. And if you go in there, Feel free to describe your business. Put links in. We're okay with that. Uh, oh, please don't great. spam. Uh, you know, do this responsibly. It, and if you do spam, we're going to take it out. Mm-hmm. But uh, do it responsibly, and we want people to be able to find it. We'll also use your postings as potential catalysts for coverage, or we might point to that in an article. But help us help people find you by going into the Earthling Forum and entering this stuff and Maybe we will do a story about it, but we can't do all the stories we would like. I think that's a great resource. And I think, especially for a new business, just trying to get out information about your business is a huge thing. So uh, this forum is a really good starting point. And, you know, the people who wa- read Earth 911 are active uh, in, in looking for these solutions and, and uh, sharing that information is, is the best way to get their attention. Mm-hmm. I agree. So our last question, um, Junior asks on Facebook, how much is it to dispose of tires? Well, so this is another question that uh, sort of hints at, do you take tires? We don't take yeah. tires. <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> Let me know how much you would charge to take yeah, my don't, tires. Don't uh, don't send me your tires. Uh, but uh, no, the uh, this is a good question because we all do run through tires. If you're getting new tires, obviously you can ask that the uh, uh, shop that replaces them recycle them responsibly. Responsibly, and I'm not sure that uh, you can always count on them to do that. But if they have a uh, a program, ask them to explain it to you before you have them recycle your tire because it may simply be, well, we put them out back and burn them later. Right. Uh, <laughs> But uh, many stores will accept the old tires with no fee if you're upgrading. On the other hand, if you just have some tires around the house, take a look at a used tire store. Uh, You know, they may pay up to $5 for a used tire, even one that has lost its tread because it can be retreaded. Mm. And then they will turn around and sell that at a discount to somebody who needs a, a reliable tire and can't afford the brand new ones. So there are ways for us to help the community overall. But thinking about, you know, res- resources around you to recycle something like tires uh, may not always be the best strategy. The first way simply may be to look for somebody who will reuse it. And that's that's what you can do with a tire that will be effective in many of the parts of the country where a recycling program is not available. Yeah, there are some, and I don't know if we have any of those stories on our in our archives, but there are some ways you can use tires for gardening. I I have a a friend who uses them for growing uh, potatoes in particular because you can, you know, take the top, you know, stack them, grow the potatoes inside, and you can take the stack apart from the top down as you sort of go down further to harvest your potatoes. And, uh, you know, that's also something where you want to be mindful of how the plastic will or the the rubber and the tires will ultimately be uh, disposed of at the end of their use in the garden. We have Mm -hmm. uh, several stories, eight creative ways to use tires uh, in the garden. Uh, (laughs) So uh, several different uh, articles there. If you want to check out tires on Earth 911, you'll find lots of uh, reuse ideas. And, of course, if you're looking for a place that will take a a tire for recycling, check search.earth911.com. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, that's all we had for today. I hope you get a good start on your early spring projects, whether you're home avoiding coronavirus or not. Thanks for listening. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. You can send us an email, feedback at earth911.com. And stay tuned on all of your regular podcast platforms. You can also always find us and all our interesting information at earth911.com. We will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.